Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all caffeinated, awakened, and uh, ready for more content. Enabling effective observability by making high-quality portable telemetry ubiquitous. This is Open Telemetry's mission statement. But what does effective observability mean to you as a service owner? You're probably thinking about the metrics, the logs, and the traces that you export into one or many um, observability platforms. And they allow you to answer questions like, is your service functioning as you expected? And when it's not, why is your service not functioning as you expected? But the reality is that your service is normally deployed in a complex distributed system. What you see here, for example, is a representation of a service mesh and Skyscanner. And each of those dots is a service. Each of those lines is a dependency between those services. And your service is deployed here. So how do you know how your changes affect that whole system? How do you know how other changes are affecting your service? Most importantly, how do you understand what your users are actually receiving as a, as a user experience when there is a, a whole internet in between you and those end users? For that, you can't just look at your own service. You need to look at the whole system holistically. And to be able to do that, you need more context. You need a bigger context, more than your own service. And this is what we're going to be talking about in this talk. My name is Daniel Gomez Blanco. I'm a principal engineer at Skyscanner, and I've been leading observability there since 2020, with a focus on adopting open telemetry, open standards, and simplifying our observability infrastructure. I originally joined in 2018 to work on client-side performance, and then quickly moved to Kubernetes resource optimization, so like two, like two sides of a, of a stack. Um, I've been a platform engineer for the last 13 years in organizations from the very small to the, to the very big. And uh, since last year, I've been elected as part of a governance committee from Open Telemetry and also published a book that talks about some of the topics that we'll be discussing in this talk. So going back to the concept of context and debugging something with context or without context. Without context, you've got intuition, right? You're thinking about how something that failed before could be failing again now. And uh, it's normally driven by RAM books. So hopefully, you've got some client-side monitoring, some RAM data that is telling you how your users are experiencing a particular regression. And that will tell you to follow a RAM book and then go check perhaps a back-end service in a metric that is maybe counting the number of 500s, a custom metric. And you may start to see a correlation there manually. You've got some intuition that it could be related. Now, as a service owner, if you're a back-end uh, service owner, you then follow that run book in the middle of the night. And uh, you're basically trying to find the, the logs that correlate to that, uh, to that regression. And you do that manually. You follow like some, perhaps some queries that you ran before. And then you may also, that run book may also tell you to go and look at a particular dashboard, a panel for like memory consumption, maybe that is correlated. So you do all that manually. And when you don't find the actual root cause, you then maybe get someone else out of bed, and then you, you start to look into perhaps another service that did not get alerted for that, but is one of your dependencies. So we're looking at the same system, but we're looking at three independent views of a service, three isolated views. We've got the client side, we've got our service, and we've got someone else's service, right? So this is all built by intuition. We've seen something before, it may happen again. And what that leads to is quite a lot of finger pointing. You've got your client, your front end team, and your back end team, and your platform team, all thinking that, you know, how do we actually connect these dots? Now, if we're thinking about context and about standards to define and to process and to transport telemetry data, then we've got evidence. We're no longer that based in that in intuition, we've got evidence. So that same client, that same end user that is experiencing a regression, they'll be propagating open telemetry trace context in a standard way. And they'll be propagating, the, they'll be exporting the traces and their spans in a particular way. So that allows you to identify in one single view how that end user experience is correlating to the back end performance. And you're able to see in one go if your problem is in the one dependency or another. But with context and with correlation, we can start to all talk about the same language, all work with the same context, right? So we've got one standard metric for, um, for HTTP metrics, and that can correlate via exemplars to that particular trace. So the front-end team and the back-end team are all talking the same language. And they're able to see from exemplars 
individual traces that were sampled at the, at the time that the uh, that that particular data point was being was being recorded. Now it works the other way as well, so you can correlate from traces and then use that um, the semantic conventions that we've got around uh, resource um, uh, information to be able to say if a particular um, operation, for example, was taken longer than expected, if there are any um, system metrics, any sort of like memory utilization metrics, for example, that would correlate to that particular experience. And you can even correlate using that same trace context and those, com those conventions correlate to um, other telemetry data that perhaps you didn't even instrument with open telemetry. For example, logs. You can correlate trace ID, span ID, seen that together. We've seen that this morning in another talk. You can correlate those errors in context, again, back to the, to the traces. And soon, as well, we'll be able to correlate profiles. So you can also start to look deep down into the code level performance that was delivered in that bad user experience. So now you're thinking, this is a lot of data, and it could get expensive. And the reality is that most telemetry data that we gather for debugging purposes is actually never used. It's not that interesting if it corresponds to successful transactions or the ones that are completed in a, in a duration and an amount of time that is not like, uh, it's not actually interesting from the point of view of debugging or optimizing our systems. And open telemetry does give you the tools to be able to, to tackle this. One of the most important ones is uh, trace sampling. So if you've not heard about it before, there are two main types of trace sampling, head sampling and tail sampling. And that allows us to keep the most useful data, the most important data, and then discard the rest. Now in head sampling, that decision of what traces to keep is done at span creation time. So you need to use the information that you've got at that time to decide if you want to keep a particular span or if you want to discard it. Um, now, this is normally done pro in a probabilistic way. So you take a trace ID, you run it through an algorithm, for example, and that gives you, um, well, let's say that uh, a decision to keep it or discard it. So let's say, for example, that you want to keep 20% of all your traces. The power of trace context and, that, and the, 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 the context that you get with tracing is that you can propagate that decision to your dependencies and to chi and to your um, children span. So, that service that decided to sample a trace can propagate that decision and a, and a dependency can then honor that decision and also sample that trace. So what you end up with is a complete view of the transaction as it went through the whole system rather than completely disjointed views that you would get if you were to sample 20% with different algorithms, right? So this is a, a simpler form of tracing, uh, of sampling in a way. It allows you to, to sample traces that for a particular percentage, for example, and it's easy to configure, easy to maintain, and doesn't require extra resources because that decision is done, um, well, when you, when you create the span. But it's not, um, it's not so powerful. It doesn't allow you to look at the whole trace. With tail sampling, on the other hand, we get to look at the whole trace. We get to um, make a decision. So we, when we receive the first span for a trace, in, a, in one single central point, we then start to buffer those spans, and at some point in time, we then go and decide if we want to keep the trace or not. Now, that is uh, quite powerful, because that allows us to then well, sample the traces that are the most important to us. For example, you can sample any trace that contains an error in any of the services, or traces that are the slowest ones, or the ones that go over a particular threshold for latency. But it is more, the, the downside is that it's more complex to operate. It requires that all your spans go through one single point. Now, open telemetry collectors give you the tooling that you need to be able to route all your spans to a particular replica and then to make those decisions, those sampling decisions. There are also uh, vendor-specific features that provide that as a service. And using tail sampling, as our Skyscanner, we tend to keep around 5% of all the millions of spans and traces that we produce every minute, which is quite powerful. We've seen teams move from logging from very verbose logging and then turn off that verbose logging, move to tracing, move to with tail sampling, and then save about 80 to 90% of the telemetry costs. Another way to think about the return on investment on your, da on your telemetry data is to use each signal for the, its intended purpose. We've got metrics, we've got traces, we've got logs for now. And then um, if you think about metrics, for example, they provide you that stable signal, right? You, you, 
you uh, produce telemetry data from metrics at a frequent interval. And uh, it doesn't matter if your particular replica is receiving 5,000 or 500 requests per second, you are going to produce a sort of stable amount of telemetry data from, that, from those metrics. Now, this lower volume of telemetry data actually allows you to make exports perhaps more resilient. You can retry your pushes or your pulls of, uh, of metric data in a more resilient way that you can perhaps do with more uh, voluminous data like traces or logs or spans or logs. So now it's important to keep the cardinality low when you're like thinking about metrics and then correlate that to, metric, to traces for that extra cardinality that you need. It's quite easy for developers to add unbound cardinality attributes to their metrics and then DDoS their own, their own infrastructure basically with that explosion in cardinality, right? So if we're thinking about metrics and low cardinality to drive alerting and to drive long-term trend analysis, then we can go into traces for other examples, as I said, with exemplars and with um, semantic conventions, we can correlate to those traces. And that gives us the high granularity, that context, the backbone of correlation for all the debugging, optimization, short-term short -term analysis, and all the good things that we get from tracing. Now, it's a bit more expensive to queue and retry if you're like producing uh, gigabytes of data per, per minute, but it, is, uh, but it does give us that backbone of correlation. It's also possible as well with open telemetry and with collectors to be able to generate metrics from spans as well. So it's not just, you need, don't always need to decide um, ahead. Now then we've got logs. You're thinking about logs as like, they are high volume, they're low context, they're not the best return on investment, but they do have their use cases for background tasks, startup shutdown, legacy libraries as well that may not be instrumented with tracing, but in which you can inject that trace context and then correlate it with your, with your traces. But just structure the logs, otherwise they're pretty much useless, right? Or use open telemetry appenders and you get a lot of these things out of the box as well, the resource uh, information, that correlation with, with trace data. And then logs as well, of course, they are the backend data model for the events API that will allow us to produce things like uh, events for infrastructure events, for example, that are not related to application logs. Another way to control the data production, let's say, from your applications is the concept of metric views. If you've never used metric views before, um, they are a powerful way to define the resulting metric streams from your application. For those that are coming from Open Census, you'll be familiar with this, but there's a way of uh, the, the metrics API gives us a way to decouple our um, measurement from how those measurements are actually aggregated. So um, what that results in is an ability for us to inform how the SDK should um, um, aggregate those measurements and change if we want to change something from how the original um, instrumentation author intended that metric to be produced. In the right-hand side, for example, we've seen a, we're seeing a, an example of a view that is um, configured to take one of the auto-instrumented uh, metrics uh, which is request duration, by default that's a histogram, but maybe I'm interested only in getting a sum of all the requests for uh, each of the routes that hit my application, right? And we can do that at runtime, we can then configure that without having to change any code and without having to change any of the API layer of how that is uh, instrumented. And that is quite powerful because if you use an instrumentation libraries, that will allow you to control the, the metrics that come out of that. And also, the more and more that we see an open telemetry integrated natively into, um, into other libraries as well, you'll be able to see that uh, to control the metric production for, for your use case. Okay, so as an observability engineer, you're thinking, this is amazing. How do you get your company involved? How do you get people to change their mindset, right? There's two, way, there's two areas to cover here. The first one is how do we communicate value to leadership? And uh, there are two avenues to explore here. The first one is the avenue of simplification and future proven, right? So open telemetry gives you that decoupling of the API layer from the SDK. And that API is a future proof, stable API. You can rely on it for stability. Now, many companies like, for example, a Skyscanner, we used to have our abstraction, our own abstraction that we had to maintain to be able to decouple ourselves from any implementation details. Now, that's what OpenTelemetry provides now um, out of the box. Now, let's decouple from the SDK 
And then you can use all the standard tooling and all the efficient tooling like open telemetry collectors for the transport and processing of that telemetry data. So that allows you to simplify that layer of uh, processing and transport pipelines into open telemetry collectors to have a standard way of handling this. And then being able to connect to observability vendors or open source solutions that you're running in-house. Now, open telemetry collectors as well will allow you to ease that migration towards um, open standards, but also ease the migration towards a vendor or a particular open source platform. And there's more and more integration of vendors and open source tooling with open telemetry as the, as the default standard for semantic conventions, so you get that as well. Now, the other area is to correlate operational health or um, product health to business outcomes, right? So if you're in a SLO journey, uh, if you've started your SLO journey, you're thinking about how to communicate the value of SLOs, it's really important to be able to measure SLIs, service, levels, service level indicators, as close as possible to the user experience, right? That's your client, which could be another service or it could be an end user. Now, with open telemetry, we can do that. We can basically start to measure things as they matter to us. And that allows you to correlate that to business KPIs, perhaps, and see how our regression on one affects the other. Now, all the things that we talked about in terms of context, propagating context, allows you as well to understand how a target that you set on a service will have an effect on the dependency chain, right? So if you understand that dependency chain, then you start to be able to set realistic and sustainable SLO targets. And that, in the end, basically ends up being meaningful reliability for your users, because you're able to relate that to your business outcomes. So when something else fails, you're able to then use all the power of observability to be able to uh, reduce your time to resolve, and in general, make everyone else happy, including the business people. Now, it's easy to convince leadership sometimes, but a more difficult is to convince some engineers in, in other teams, because not everyone cares about observability. So one of the things that is, um, has worked, uh, at least in, in our case, is to achieve cross-organization alignment. And there are two groups of engineers that are, to me, that are critical in this path. One is observability engineers. They're normally part of a single team. They are your observability experts, your telemetry experts. They're in charge of um, implementing those company-wide standards, like, for example, um, deciding what protocols to use, what um, SDK config for the open telemetry config, or use an open telemetry distro. You want to maybe create your own distro. And they are the ones normally in charge of maintaining the infrastructure, if you're running uh, your back end as well, in charge of maintaining that. And then making sure that the path of least resistance is the golden path for everyone to follow. So making it super easy to be able to adopt the best practices. There is another group that I like to call observability ambassadors, uh, but you can name them by other names, observability champions, working across the organization to deliver those best practices. Now, that work on adoption is as important as the work on enablement. And they're crucial because they understand the domain in which they operate, but they also understand the usage of the API. They don't need to be telemetry experts. They don't need to understand perhaps how the telemetry is then passed down to collectors and, and all that, but they understand the API layer and they understand the instrumentation packages that they use. So this group of people are basically in charge of adopting those um, standards to their domain. And you get both of them together, like the observability engineers and the observability ambassadors, and they can work together to deliver that cross-organization alignment. Now, one of the things that is important to understand as well is that we all learn by doing, not seeing. So you want to make it fun. Make it fun to actually understand the value of observability from an engineering perspective. The best way to do that is to train with hands-on exercises, hands-on labs. Because debugging is a skill, and it can be trained as well. And if people have never used tracing before, there's no reason for, that, for them to start using it again um, in the first place. So um, one of the things that has worked quite well in our case as Skyscanner has been gamifying root cause analysis. We uh, recently published a blog post on the OpenTelemetry website that 
talks about this in more detail. Um, but we're taking the wheel of misfortune that was popularized by Google and then using the open telemetry demo to simulate um, incidents in a, in a system instrumented with open telemetry. Now, that allows us to then take those teams, put several teams in the same observability game day, and let them play against each other, see who actually debugs an issue the fastest, right? So that allows them to understand open telemetry concepts, also the platform in which they work. And in my experience, the teams that use context are normally the ones that, that win. So a few uh, takeaway points. The first one is to use context over intuition. You can no longer pretend, if you work in a com complex distributed system, that your debugging and monitoring practices of, uh, of five years or 10 years ago will work in, in our complex systems of nowadays. So if you've got context, you've got evidence. If you've got no context, you just have whatever like happened before may happen again sort of intuition. Use the right tool for the right job. We've got multiple signals in open telemetry for a reason. And each of them has the pros and the cons. Understand them, making sure that they all um, work as suspected, and also correlate between, between these signals. And understand that observability is a cross-functional discipline. Observability is not like something that only observability engineers care about. You need to make that adoption of best practices roll out across your organization from engineers all the way down to um, business analysts if they want to understand the implications with user experience. Because that is actually what makes observability effective. So um, that's it for, for now. Uh, I, I think that we've got some time for questions. Otherwise, you can catch me at the Open Telemetry Observatory in the Expo Hall from tomorrow. And then as well, we've got this feedback for feedback form if you want to leave any feedback in this session. Thank you.